Thank you all for your talks. It's really nice to have you here. Um, a, a couple questions that I'm, I think it'll probably be both Lucia and Jackson and Virginia, you have so much quick experience. I, it might be related to, uh, in your area as well. In Southern California, we hear a lot from our African-American participants that WIC is a Hispanic program. And I didn't know if that popped up in any of your work, um, you know, at the, whether it's just the education or really what for our committee, is it the foods? So uh, Lucia, your, your presentation was very helpful in the sense that there seems to be a lot of overlap in the foods that many of the ethnic groups are choosing. But is that a theme that has emerged anywhere else or is this sort of one of these unique things um, to California where we have such a large Hispanic population? Oh, I've heard other people in California say that. And I don't know, we have such a high Hispanic population here. And um, in fact, I presented this, the other, this talk the other day to some people in our department and, and that independently came up as an issue. Um, and I, I think it's not just the foods, I think it may be that in, in reaching a Spanish audience, you have a Spanish speaking staff. And um, then there's just an appearance about the clinics that, that make it seem that way. Um, but one person pointed out, and I think this is really important, is that if these foods are, are very important for people, let's say the lower fat milks, if that's what we really wish to, to promote, then, um, then we really need to seriously ask ourselves the question of whether our education is reaching the audiences in the ways that they should be, reaching everybody consistently, or are we bypassing some audiences because we have so many of one group and we're really working hard to serve these groups that are, that are now our majority in our clinics? Are we overlooking some of the other groups that, um, that if we, if we, were more consistent or, or used messaging that was more culturally appropriate for them, would, would, would they see the benefits and make those changes too? And, and so I think it's hard to tell, um, but I think we, we have to ask ourselves that question if we're providing the whole package of services, not just the foods, but also the other services that, that we want all our clients to have. If um, I can, uh, it, why don't you go ahead, please? Um, that's a, a great question, Shannon. Um, we have also seen in New York State um, a racial ethnic effect in terms of redemption. Um, but fortunately, we have just concluded um, a study that was funded by um, USDA under the WIC Special Project Grant uh, Program. And um, so we're able to um, uh, conduct a mixed method sort of research study where we actually uh, implemented interventions to promote um, you know, positive shopping experience. Everyone has talked about the importance of ensuring that the shopping experience is pleasant. Uh, and in the course of implementing those interventions, uh, we conducted various focus groups with staff um, and then with um, vendors as well. And what was, um, what's sort of like really stood out from that qualitative research was that there appears to be higher, you know, not necessarily quantitatively, but we tended to hear more about um, really stigma of participating in the WIC program when it pertained to African-American participants or white participants. And I thought earlier someone presented showing the redemptions being, I think it was 9% for African-Americans and then maybe 10% or 11% for white. So that seemed to really correspond with that qualitative research as showing uh, more perception of stigma. We heard this even in rural parts of New York State uh, where you're dealing with mostly white participants. There will be some perception of stigma uh, as far as participating in, in WIC. But we don't hear that uh, as far as Asian or Hispanic participants. Um, so I think that there's something there in terms of how uh, those particular subgroups about what WIC still means to them. Uh, maybe there, there's a way to try and address that. So I think it's a really important question and I think the first issue is one of bias, real conscious bias, and the other is the unconscious bias. Um, having grown up in a different part of the country, the, the issue was, oh, WIC is an African-American program. You know, if, 
if I were in you know, California today, it may be Hispanic. And also, we all know the overlay of the Hispanic crosses across many of what we think of as racial groups. Um, so I think it is complex in that way. But I think that just reflects uh, bias against lower income people. And when people get into that, it's like, and then if you were the majority in the WIC and now you see yourself as being displaced in some way, which I think, or not displaced, but there are those other people coming. Um, I think a lot of that is there. So I think from um, our points of view and administrative points of view, um, remembering as it changes for services to follow, but don't forget everybody. I, I, in Philly, we have uh, in the Einstein system quite an area where we have new Russian immigrants. So there are people who speak Russian, you know, at the WIC office. There are people who speak Russian in the newborn nursery to get everybody out. But we've got to keep it open uh, to everyone, and we, with, it's been around long enough that its population is changing and it's becoming more and more regionalized. Um, I think the issue about broadening the food basket is still rippling down. Remember when it was like everybody thought it was nothing but commodity cheese and peanut butter and these leftover things. Well, now we've made such good stead with offering variety. Um, you know, some of that may still be happening. And also, if I can just add a little bit. So our study was focusing really on retention in the WIC program. Uh, when we, in the formative research phase of the study, we had wanted to do a sort of best-west comparison where we look at the agencies that had the highest retention rates compared to the, those that had the lowest retention rates. So when we did focus groups and key informant interviews with some of the directors, um, those that tended to have high retention rates uh, tended to really emphasize uh, focus on customer service and cultural competence within the agencies. And really when you do look at agencies where you have a lot of Asians, because uh, we went there to do these side visits and interview you know, people and observe, do direct observation over time, you do see that cultural you know, competence, even when people can speak English, but there's someone who they can relate to. Uh, I remember one instance where there was someone who uh, spoke Korean and talked about how now that there was a Korean speaking person in that particular WIC clinic, she feels much more comfortable coming. So I think when you're dealing maybe with uh, African Americans and, uh, 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 and a pe person who identifies white, where they've been in rural areas, um, we may look at that concordance just in terms of racial and ethnic clubs, but maybe in terms of socioeconomic background. So for example, if you have young nutritionists who really have never been exposed to WIC, how do they relate to sort of low-income people um, and uh, some of the messages they may be communicating when they don't intend to may be coming across as, oh, these people are taking advantage of uh, uh, government you know, programs, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, whereas maybe on the other side, when they're dealing with Hispanic or other Asian participants, I'm sorry, staff, they're not necessarily maybe getting those kinds of you know, messages. I don't know. But that was interesting. You know, one other comment that I want to make is that I, I think um, it's very important that we have timely data, that we have a systematic way of, of continually monitoring this across different subgroups. And just because the numbers of some of these people are not great, there's, there's small numbers of them, we still need to know what's going on across these groups. And it was very hard to put this together, really, because it's kind of haphazard out there in what is in the published literature. So in future waves of revising the food WIC packages, we need a better way to collect and report on and understand what's happening to different populations across the, all the areas that we serve um, so that we can make sure we're really reaching everybody equally and equitably. I have a question for Jackson. Um, I was just curious with the data that you have on, on health um, status, health outcomes, are, are there other um, things that you can look at with your data set, such as for the pregnant women, risk of uh, preterm delivery or uh, rate of gestational diabetes, things like that? Excellent. That's an excellent question. I know I didn't do um, you know, justice sort of describing the methods in the study because I was much more focused on being within the allotted time. Uh, so the data sets that we use are from the uh, PEDNIS and the PINS extracts, which we used to submit, you know, quarterly or monthly to the CDC. Uh, one of the reasons why we, um, you know, limited to some of the years that we did is just had to do with those are the data we had at that time. Because just going to extract the data, even though it's housed right there with us, takes 
a year or two, and our IT staff, New York State has been going through an IT consolidation uh, process where all of IT across agencies we manage you know, under the same roof, so it's been very difficult just to extract data. Uh, needless to say, the data s sources are the PINs and PEDNAS extracts, so those states uh, that used to participate uh, in the national PEDNAS and PINs, that's essentially what we're doing. And as far as the definitions, um, we're using really what you know, the CDC used to use. Um, so all of the indicators that were available through PEDNAS on PINs, that's essentially uh, what we can replicate as well. We just chose to focus on those because we thought they were most relevant for this impact assessment. Um, and then for linking, so you notice we had moms, uh, the adequacy of weight gain, we actually had to link uh, the PINs extracts with the PEDNAS extra to identify mother uh, infant pairs. So that's how we're able to do that. Thank you. And we do have some redemption data, which I didn't show you here, just because I knew other uh, sessions were focusing on that. So they're not included there. Do we have any other questions from the committee? Okay, then. Thank you very much. So we're going to take a break now and we will restart at 3.30, so see you back then. <laughs>